Take your Bibles with me and turn to Exodus chapter 3. And today we're going to continue with our uh, theme of a renewed vision. And specifically today I want to speak about when the vision is impaired and needs a renewal. When the vision is impaired and needs renewal. Exodus chapter 3, you'll know the story there, very familiar. Moses meets uh, there uh, the Lord on the, in the burning bush and gives him instruction, gives him a vision of what he is about to do. So let's be upstanding in honor of reading God's word. We're going to go through a few, few passages. Uh, the, the story goes from chapter 3 right through to chapter 12 and 13, but we're not going to cover every verse, obviously, through those pages, but we will pick uh, certain things and learn today about how God gave that vision and how he renewed it and enlarged it and, uh, and then showed them some great things that he was going to do in them and through them. So Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and, the, uh, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Wouldn't that be something amazing to see? Uh, to be there uh, and to see that happening. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Listen, any time you get to meet with the Lord, it is holy ground. And uh, we need to make sure that we are sanctified and clean when we meet the Lord. Verse 6, moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large and unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Father, this morning we need you. We pray that you would help us, that the Spirit of God will visit us and will illuminate our eyes of understanding. Lord, I pray that you would renew our vision. Help me, Lord, to speak those things that you would have me to say. And Lord, uh, we pray that your word, as you promised, uh, will go forth with great power to accomplish its task in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would do this mighty work in us. May this not be today, the day of uh, men just laboring, but that the Spirit of God uh, uh, doing a work in our hearts that only he could do. I pray, Lord, and thank you for these, your people, these worshippers that have come, and those who are joining online. I pray, Lord, that you would help us today to see Christ and to see your will for our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, you know the story. Uh, the children of Israel had been in Egypt now for 400 years. Uh, there came a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. You remember the story of Joseph? How he interpreted the dream to Pharaoh about the seven years of plenty, then seven years of famine. And Pharaoh made him second in charge. And, and so... Uh, uh, there one day his brethren come and to buy uh, food, uh, to buy grain. And, and you know the story, how he re ends up revealing himself and, and asking them to bring the whole family down. So Jacob, uh, with the whole, the whole household, makes a move uh, into Egypt and they are given the land of Goshen because they are shepherds. Now remember, shepherds were despised in the eyes of the Egyptians. And so 400 years go by and there's a pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph. 
does not know about what took place. And so he oppresses the people and oppresses these children of Israel. And they cry out to God to be delivered, for the mercy of God to deliver them out of Egypt. And you know the story of Moses, how Moses came on the scene and how God uh, raised him up. He, he was a Jew who grew up in, the, in Pharaoh's court and uh, desired no longer to be uh, called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, uh, but esteemed his, uh, the, the shame of his people and thought that he could deliver them, thought he could deliver them in his own might. But uh, he slew an Egyptian and ran away. And now for 40 years, he's been in the desert just feeding sheep. You can imagine how life changed upside down for Moses. From being in Pharaoh's court, highly esteemed uh, as someone who was very popular and powerful with authority and uh, could command and ask for anything that he wanted that now for 40 years he is in the desert looking after sheep uh, people said that uh, someone said this uh, uh, Moses spent 40 years thinking he is everything then 40 years in the desert learning that he is nothing and then the next 40 years leading God's people in the wilderness, that God is everything. And uh, here we find now in this junction where Moses now is coming through. Uh, he's, he's not a young man. Uh, he's around about the 80 mark now. And, uh, and God appears to him there in a burning bush and gives him a vision, gives him a calling, puts something in his heart and says, I'm going to take you, you're going to go and you're going to deliver my people out of Egypt. I've heard their cry, I've seen their oppression, I'm going to deliver them and Moses, I am going to use you. Now you know the story, Moses uh, makes a few uh, comments to the Lord uh, as, as to why uh, he is not the one or he feels inadequate. Now sometimes we give Moses a hard time about that, but I, I can imagine that if any of us had a calling to such a great work we would see how limited we are and how inadequate we are in order to do a great task and so God equips him and the Lord says it to him I'm with you I'm going to give you your brother Aaron he's going to be your spokesperson he's going to speak on your behalf and and I'm going to be with you and I'm going to deliver the children of Israel with great power now what a great calling and what a great vision that was but you know, the vision never went according to plan. It wasn't as easy as what these words were. It wasn't as easy that when Moses came to Egypt, it wasn't that easy to try to yeah, convince the people. It wasn't that easy to just go in front of Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh, let my, God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh just said, okay, I'll let your people go. It wasn't that easy to fulfill the vision that God gave him. Sometimes, the vision is prolonged. Sometimes that work uh, gets protracted out and uh, the vision can get a little bit impaired. Uh, we begin to wonder, well, how is this going to be fulfilled? Uh, God, you gave me a command, you gave me a vision of what I needed to do and here I am, but it's not working out the way you told me it was going to work out. It, there seems to be a lot of bumps in the road. There seems to be a lot of opposition. It seems like things are not going according to plan. Did I get that vision right? You ever doubted yourself about what God wanted you to do? You ever felt in your heart, I know this is what God wants me to do. And when you set out to do it, it doesn't seem to work out the way you thought it was going to work out. It, it didn't like, travel according to the plan that you thought in your head that, oh, well, that, that's going to be fine, it's just going to happen that way. Uh, doesn't life bring about a lot of surprises? There's twists and turns uh, that we never expected. Uh, there are things that come out of nowhere that puts a span in the works and maybe deviates us a little bit or maybe makes us doubt whether that vision was right, whether that vision was true, and, and we begin to be a little bit clouded, clouded around is this really what God wants me to do? I was 16 years of age uh, when I was at a conference, uh, an NBF meeting, and I felt the Lord uh, called me into full-time ministry. I, I believe that that's what the Lord would have me to do. But you know, with that vision and that burden that God gave me, it never panned out in that direction. 
It never worked out the way I thought it would be, that I would finish school, then I'd go to Bible college, and I'd be into some kind of church work, and, and that there uh, minister and, and grow uh, in ministry, and then one day maybe pastor. I, never, I never, never conceived in my wildest imagination that my path would be totally different. When I finished school, I, I was giving counsel to go and learn a profession, go to university. I remember that time sitting back then with Pastor Hester and, and uh, my father, and, and, uh, and the, the counsel was that, you know, it would be very difficult for you to be sustained if you just came into the ministry now. It's good for you to go study, that way you can work and serve at the same time. And uh, I heard that counsel and I was like, are you, are you sure? Like, I'm putting my hand up and I'm volunteering. I, I want to be in the ministry and you're telling me, go to university? Like, for me, it was, uh, it was strange. I, I never thought it would work out and it would pan out that way. And so I began my journey through the business world, uh, learning, growing, experiencing things and, and uh, being shaped. Being shaped as a man, being shaped... Uh, to do ministry in a different way. And, and uh, when the time came to go into the ministry, I was 48 years old, 30 years later. Uh, you would never think when I was 18 that I would have to wait 30 years before I could enter into full-time ministry. Uh, I never conceived that in my mind, but, but the Lord had other plans. And let me tell you, during that period of time when the vision got a little bit impaired and, and I got to doubt what, what God really called me to do, he reinforced it or he renewed it for me along the way. If you would ask me, would you, would you have gone through what you went through to become pastor, I would say to you, no, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, but the Lord prepares us and readies us for the job in his time. And I'm thankful that when God gives us a vision, uh, gives us something that he puts in our hearts, and he's given each one of you a calling and a vision in your heart. But sometimes we digress, we leave the vision because it's impaired, we doubt it, we don't know that that's exactly what God is going to fulfill because we haven't seen it unfold the way we imagined it to be. And so here is Moses. Moses thought he could deliver the children of Israel by his own power and might but found out very quickly that it wasn't going to be by him. It wasn't by his power. What he needed was God's power. And the Lord needed him to go to the desert to learn for 40 years that he is not everything. Can you imagine what, what Moses would have thought and communed with himself? He, you know, he sat there and watching the sheep, his father-in-law's sheep. I mean, I, I, I can't seem to think that that would be a very exciting job. I think he would be uh, contending with some of these stubborn sheep and, and trying to get them back into order to follow him. And, and you know, you think, is, was this a waste of time? No, it wasn't a waste of time. What Moses learned in leading sheep, he needed to lead the children of Israel. As stubborn as the sheep are, he had stubborn people that he had to lead. You see, God is infinite in his wisdom. He knows how to prepare. He knows how, what the plan is. And, and he wants to ready you and ready me just like he readied Moses for the task. So we find that, that the vision is communicated and, and uh, what happens when that vision is delayed? Uh, here Moses received the, receives the vision at the burning bush. Uh, he sees, uh, uh, you know, it caught his attention. He wanted to see why this bush was burning but was not being consumed. And God calls him out of that burning bush and says, Moses, Moses. Now, I'm sure none of us have had a dramatic experience of, that, of such nature. Uh, you know, if I, if I heard God call my name, I would uh, like be, be like, a, a, you know, so scared and petrified that someone called my name out of nowhere. But here is Moses. Here he is before the burning bush and God gives him clear instruction. You know what it always starts off with? God impressing upon a, upon a heart a need and a vision to fulfill that need. See, God impresses on you, he shows you a need, 
and why you are the person to help fulfill that need. Has God, have you ever had an encounter with God in that way? Have you ever, have you ever been with God alone and, and God impressed upon you and showed you a need and said, this is my vision, this is what I would have you to do. And this is what I would have you to fulfill. You know, one of the great things of life is to know what our purpose is And what is the vision that God has given us? And to begin to go and get it accomplished. And to get it done. I mean, that's the real quality of life. When I know I have fulfilled my purpose according to the calling of God in my life. And so here Moses receives the vision. Receives the vision, has trouble in accepting it, feeling inadequate, but God helps him. The Lord encourages him. He shows him a few miracles. He says, put down your rod. And it became a serpent. And then he had to grab it by itself. Listen, if that rod turned into a serpent in front of me, I'm running. I'm not touching that thing. Uh, You know, I'm okay with everything else, but I'm just petrified of snakes. I I don't like snakes whatsoever. But here God turns, turns that rod into a snake and says to him, grab it by the tail and became a rod again. He said, put your hand into your bosom. And, and when he took it out, it became leprous. And, uh, and I think God confirmed to him, God confirmed to him that this is exactly what he wanted him to do. I don't, I don't believe that Moses left that scene with any doubt in his mind what God would have him to do. Would you? And he knew beyond a shadow of doubt that that was God's calling, that was God's vision for him, and he had to obey it and go and perform it. Regardless of what his limitations were, regardless of what his inadequacies were, God communicated a vision for him to go and fulfill. Well, it's not that long before he hits a few bumps along the way. That vision becomes a little bit clouded. That vision becomes a little bit difficult. Uh, That vision seems a little bit of an impossibility for him to accomplish. And so there's one obstacle after the other. Have a look with me in chapter 5. When he gets before Pharaoh and he goes in there to say to him uh, that let my people go. Look what happened in chapter 5 verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Well, there's the first, you know, there's the first thing. Well, God, you asked me to go and to speak and command Pharaoh to let the people go. And I'm here and I'm doing what you asked me to do. But it's not working out the way I thought it's going to work. Pharaoh says, who is this Lord? Uh, Who is this God that you're saying that you want to go and worship. I don't know him. And besides, I, I, I'm not going to let the people go. The, the people are, are working for me. They are, are making bricks. Uh, they're helping me build a city. Uh, I'm not going to just let my workforce just walk out just like that. Pharaoh's interest in keeping the people was in direct conflict to what God wanted them to do. Sometimes you hit a bump in the road, you, you hit a bump where the, there's a conflict of interest uh, between what somebody is doing or what even you are doing to what God would require you to do. You ever felt that? Uh, God would call you maybe or to, into full-time ministry or maybe calling your child into full-time ministry and it's in direct conflict with what you're desiring. It's in direct conflict with what your plans are. Uh, you know, we have aspirations and plans for our children, but if God would put his hand on one of them and call them into the ministry, would that be a direct conflict with your interest? Or would that be a direct conflict with the plans that you had for your family, for your children, for what life would be like, even for yourself? Sometimes when there is that self-interest that comes in the, in the way, it begins to impair the vision a little bit. We, we begin to think, well, how is this going to work out? Uh, how, how am I going to fulfill what God has called me to do? But on this side, I need to be working. I need to be providing. I have bills to pay. I have a mortgage to pay. I, I'm not sure how the two are going to match. Sometimes a self-interest can be in conflict with the vision that God gives you. Sometimes it is the hardness of our heart. 
The hardness of our heart will sometimes uh, impair the vision. Uh, Moses appeared before Pharaoh uh, something like nine times. And uh, we won't go through all the verses, but in chapter 7, uh, Moses uh, performs the miracle of changing the water to blood. You know the ten plagues, uh, the nine of them, in each one of them, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Uh, when he converted the water to blood, you say, surely now Pharaoh would let the people go. But in, in chapter 7, verse 22, the Bible says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. In the, the, the plague of the frogs in chapter 8, and uh, there were frogs that came upon, uh, the, uh, upon, the, uh, upon the Egyptians, and, and he entreated Moses and said, please pray and remove these frogs from us. And when Moses did, the Bible says in verse 15 that Pharaoh also hardened his heart. Then there was the plague of lice. The lice came upon them and upon their beasts. And, and again, Pharaoh uh, thinking, saying, well, okay, okay, I give up. But then changes his mind and hardens his heart in verse 19. The plague of the flies in chapter 8, again, once again, flies were everywhere. Now, there was not enough error to help the Egyptians at that time. I mean, those flies were everywhere. They were in your face, they were in your food, they were in your bed. Uh, they were everywhere. And once again, you would think after this great plague that Pharaoh would soften his heart. But the Bible says that again, Pharaoh hardened his heart in verse 32. God then sent a disease upon the cattle and destroyed most of the cattle in chapter 9. But again, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. In verse 7. Now, can you imagine with me, time and time again, uh, this is taking time. This is not a matter of a day or two. Uh, this is taking time. And Moses is thinking, like, this surely is going to be enough evidence for, for Pharaoh to be softened, to, to, get, to submit to God's command, and he will let the people go. But you know what ends up happening? Pharaoh continues to harden his heart. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart when God struck them with boils. In chapter 9, verse 12, he hardened his heart when hail came down from heaven and it consumed all their crops and their beasts. And, and in chapter 9, verse 34, again, Pharaoh hardened his heart. God sent locusts. Whatever the hail did not consume, locusts came and ate and demolished all their crops and all their trees. And uh, everything became like a, like a dearth. Everything was eaten up. Yet in chapter 10, verse 20, we read again that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Darkness came upon the land uh, of Egypt, except in the land of Goshen. And, and they couldn't see, even in front of their faces, uh, for, for three days. And in chapter 10, verse 27, again, Moses has hardened his heart. You know, you, you begin to think here, after nine attempts, nine attempts of going before Pharaoh and saying, Pharaoh, let my people go, that, that the vision was going to be fulfilled. At time and time again, there was an obstacle, there was a wall that Moses faced. Uh, it was again, yeah, no, we're not going to let you go. Oh, if you're going to go, just the men go. No, no, we want everybody to go. No, uh, then you can go and leave your little ones here. No, we want everybody to go. Then you can go and leave your beasts behind. No, we need our beasts in order to sacrifice. Time and time again, there was an objection. There was a confrontation. There was something that put a stop to the fulfillment of that vision. Tell me, how would you feel after the first round or maybe the second round? maybe the third round. There's a continued objection or an obstacle for that vision to be performed. Now you say, well, why would God allow this to happen? Why, why would God protract uh, uh, his purpose? And, and why, would he, why would he let Pharaoh take all this time and, and to confuse or maybe uh, to put a limit on God's plan? Listen, God is not bound by our time frames. You know, we seem to think it's got to be now. It's got to be. God understands that he's outside of time. He will accomplish his purpose. And so here, um, here Moses wonders uh, what is really going on. How, how is this going to happen? But God confirms uh, his, uh, his vision to him in chapter 6. In chapter 6, God renews that uh, as he was disheartened about what's taking place and, and seeing exactly how others were being uh, uh, treated, God renews that vision in chapter 6. The vision also was impaired by 
seeing things not working out according to plan. Have a look with me in chapter 5, verses 19 and 23. And the officers of the children of Israel, you know the story. Uh, 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 Pharaoh said, well, you must be idle. I'm not going to give you straw anymore. You go, collect, stubble, whatever. But the tally of bricks have to be the same. And so they were beaten. The elders, the leaders were beaten because they were not performing to fulfill their brick tally. And so we see in verse 19, and the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case after it was said you shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily tasks you know they thought well, this is we're in just a terrible situation we I don't know how we're going to get out of it uh, we've just been plunged into this uh, into the, into this uh, situation uh, of Pharaoh is being so hard upon us that this wasn't our fault Moses, you're the one who went and spoke before Pharaoh and brought us to this position that we're in right now. And they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our savour to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his servants to put a, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. Sometimes the vision can get impaired when things go pear-shaped and people begin to blame you. They begin to blame you. Hey, what is this great idea? You said that God is leading you. God is wanting us to do this. And, and it's not working out. It's, it's not coming out the way we thought it was going to be. You know, when things don't go according to plan, it's quite interesting how many people become critics and become you know, they begin to point the finger. Ah, oh, the reason why we're here is because you made that decision. Ah, oh, because uh, if you had listened to us, it would have been different. You know, the vision, sometimes we, be, we begin to doubt it. We begin to be impaired about what God really called us to do because we're seeing so much opposition. This is not opposition from Pharaoh now. This is opposition from our own people. And these are the people who are supposed to be encouraging us. These are the people who are supposed to be, uh, you know, with us on the bandwagon. We're going to go together. We're, I'm here for a purpose to help you to get out of bondage. But now they even turned on, their, on him. You begin to question and wonder, Lord, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? Moses cries out in verse 22, Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, Wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he has done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Do you think, do you think Moses has reached the bottom now? Do you think he's reached despair? Do you think he's reached the point of saying, what am I doing here? Why in the world am I here? God, you, you, you gave me this vision. You gave me this calling. You gave me this direction. I believe with all my heart that that's what you wanted me to do. But God, when I look around, it seems to be a failure everywhere. It just doesn't seem to be heading in the right direction. It just doesn't seem to be working out, Lord, the way you told me it was going to work out. And, and I'm at the end of myself. I'm, I'm at the end of what this calling and this vision is. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't even know how this will go. And so the Lord understands. Understands Moses' frustrations. He understands where he's at. He understands his doubts. He understands his thoughts. And gives him a renewal of a covenant in chapter 6. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his hand. God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. By the name of God Almighty, by my name Jehovah, was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, 
and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out of out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land concerning which I swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Isn't it wonderful how the Lord renews the vision? And sometimes when we hit a lot of, you know, a, a lot of obstacles or, or we seem like we're banging our head against the wall, the Lord brings a reminder. He refreshes. And not only is it a refreshment, but now it's an enlargement of that vision. And now God has showed him even something greater about what he's going to do. How with a strong and mighty arm, uh, you said, you just watch now and see what I'm going to do. How I'm going to deliver them with a great mighty hand. Uh, I'm going to fulfill my promise. I'm going to fulfill my covenant that I gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, you just watch me. They, they didn't know me before uh, as I have now declared myself to them. Uh, I, my, by, by my name, Jehovah. Uh, I was not known to them by that name, but I want you to now go and proclaim and show them that this is a renewed vision that God has given you a direction of how they need to leave Egypt. What did you see when Moses ends up Again, with the people in verse 9, Moses spoke unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Now, that sometimes happens. Sometimes that people will not listen, will not follow you, uh, will not get on board, will not grasp the vision, not because of just the hardness of their heart, not because there's conflict in their self-interest, uh, uh, but here in this very verse it says, because of the anguish of spirit. Sometimes it's very hard for people who are suffering, they're suffering in the home, they're suffering personally, it's very hard for them to grasp onto the vision. It's very hard for them to accept the vision that God has given because uh, the emotions are so intense about the suffering that they are experiencing there and then uh, that they cannot see, uh, they cannot look ahead, they cannot uh, accept that there's something greater that God has for them. Have you ever been there? Have you ever experienced suffering? Have you ever experienced maybe anguish in your, in your life? Maybe it could have been the death of a loved one. Maybe it is, uh, you know, uh, a disease or something terminal that is, uh, the doctors have told you, have told you about a loved one in your family or your husband or someone who died, maybe a child who got really sick. You know, there's great anguish of soul, isn't there? Sometimes it's very hard to catch on. Sometimes the vision gets impaired when there's the anguish of soul and spirit. And the Lord understands that. The Lord understands that. But what we need to do is that not let go, let not lose hope of the vision that God has given us, not let go of the direction that God wants us uh, to go through. Even though we might be in a time of suffering, I want you to be patiently waiting on the Lord, and the Lord will be able to redirect your path. Now we find here that this vision was prolonged, but what was God trying to do? Well, why did he allow for this vision to take so long for it to be performed? Well, God was doing the work. Uh, when we don't see things are happening, God is at work. Uh, today you might be wondering, well, or what, why is it taking so long for what God has given me as a vision for something to do? Why hasn't that been fulfilled yet? God is at work. Don't think that God has gone on holidays or he's knocked off. You know, he's kind of finished his time and, and uh, he, he's rung his card and now he's on the weekend and not thinking and, and not thinking about you and not having to fulfill those dreams and that vision for you. No, God is still at work. God has to prepare something. God has to do a work ahead of you, behind the scenes, in order for the vision to be completed and to be performed. What we need to do is to be waiting on Him, to be waiting on Him. Have a look here. I find the three things that God was doing in preparing or in prolonging the vision and fulfilling it in the life of Moses. First of all, I find that God was wanting to make sure that Pharaoh and all of Egypt understood who he was and he magnified himself in their eyes. Have a look in chapter 7, chapter 7 verses 1 to 5, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. 
and shall speak all that I command thee. And Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, and he sent, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt, and bring forth mine armies and my people and the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. God had a purpose. You see, uh, had, had the vision uh, been fulfilled automatically from the first time that, Fa that Moses appeared to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said, yep, sure thing, you go, everybody go out. Uh, the Egyptians would have never had the chance and the opportunity to experience what a great God, the God of Israel was. You see, through this process, God wanted to make sure that when the, when the people of God were going to leave, they left a, a witness of a great God in the land of Egypt. You see, in fact, we find that when, when Moses and Aaron performed the first couple of miracles, the magicians came around and did the same thing. Uh, but when the lice came on the, uh, upon, the, uh, upon the face of, uh, of Egypt, uh, they went to Pharaoh and said, we can't do this. This has to be the finger of God. Uh, even his counsel is now beginning to be aware. Hold on, wait a minute. Uh, this is extraordinary. We couldn't even replicate this. Uh, this has got to be the hand of God. And, and by the end of it, the people are entreating Pharaoh and saying to him, please, just let them go. Can't you see what has happened to us? Can't you see how the land around us has been desolated? Can't you see what has happened? Why are you still so stubborn? See, God wanted to magnify himself in the land of Egypt. Sometimes God is doing a work in the lives of people around you that he is magnifying himself that they would recognize who he is. Sometimes we go through trials and tribulations and we hear about different tragedies and different sufferings that are happening around in our families and we're wondering, we're saying, God, why, why would you do this? Why, this would just hinder what you've given me as a vision. Now, listen, God is working all things together for good to them that love him. God is going to fulfill his purpose even though it may seem difficult, even though it may, the obstacles are, are all around us, and God is going to magnify himself in the eyes of the people. Number two, I want you to see in chapter 10 that he wanted them to understand this was his people. And he wanted them to understand that it was a great, mighty work that he did for them. In chapter 10, and the Lord said unto Moses, verse 1, Go in unto Pharaoh, and I have hardened his heart and the heart of his service. Now, let me stop here. People get a little bit, a little bit um, funny about God hard hardening Pharaoh's heart. You know, God did this on purpose to Pharaoh. Now, let me tell you, when God allows a man to continue in his own ways, that man hardens his heart. You know, one of the most unmerciful things God can do to any individual is not to uh, interact in his life and put a limit to what he's doing. And when God lets you run in your own desires and in your own head and your own stubbornness, he's allowing you to harden your heart even further. And he, Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardened, has hardened his heart that I may show these signs before him. Verse 2, and that thou mayst tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son that things that I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. Well, this wasn't just about the people of Egypt. God was going to show himself how strong he was for his own people. Hey, the vision was prolonged. The vision may have been impaired and, and God did not fulfill it straight away because he was going to do a work in their life. Uh, they were going to see how difficult it was. Uh, this wasn't going to be easy. In fact, it got even worse. Uh, he wanted us to make bricks without giving us straw. Uh, we've been beaten. Uh, we, we've been oppressed. How, how could that be God's purpose? See, God was doing all of that to fulfill in their eyes what great deliverance he was going to give them. And that they will not soon forget it. And that they will tell their children and their grandchildren for generations to come how a mighty hand of God delivered them out of Egypt. Let me tell you, when, when you find yourself in a situation where things are not going according to plan, when things look a bit 
cruel and, and the, the oppression is great and the suffering is great and, and uh, you don't know whether, which way you're heading, whether it's north, south, east or west and, and you're all confused. I just want you to wait on the Lord because God will make, will, has got you in that place for a reason. So that when he works, you can only say, this is God who did this for me. I've been in situations in my life where it seemed like it was all helpless and there was no answer and I'm begging God for an answer. But let me tell you, when the answer came and deliverance came, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that this was God who brought this deliverance. God wants to magnify himself in your life and in your eyes. He wants you to see him. You know, the greatest time we see God and he, in his great wonder and power is when we are at our knees, when we're right at the bottom, when we see there's no more help, there's no solution. Lord, I don't know where to go from here. God, I have only got you. My eyes are upon you. Lord, I need you to bring this deliverance. That's the real time when we get to see God doing some great things for us. The mercy of God is upon us every day, but none of us recognize the mercy of God. Like we've come and gone and we've done our activities. None of us ever stopped during this week and said, God, that was your mercy. You protected me this week. See, we don't see that. Uh, but when I am sick, well, when I'm in that hospital bed and I've got news that, that you know, I've got some kind of terminal illness and, and I'm crying out to God and, and people are praying for me and God is doing a work in my life and, and God brings deliverance, guess what? who we recognized at that time. We said, that was God's mercy upon me. It was God's mercy that he's given me a few more years to live. God, it's God's mercy that he has put my cancer in remission. It, it is God's mercy upon me that he's given me extra time. You see, we recognize the mercy of God. God sometimes prolongs the vision, the fulfillment of vision, to magnify himself in our life. Secondly, I want you to see that he prolongs the vision because he wants to judge the heart and the heart. The Bible says that he, in chapter 7, and verse 4, when he was talking about the Egyptians, he said that out of the land of Egypt, by great judgments. God was going to judge the children of Egypt, the, the Egyptians. He was going to judge them for all their rebellion and their pagan idol worship and their dismissal and refusal to know God. You see, the children of Israel were there for 400 years. Do you think they should have known about the God of the Israelites? But they did not want to do anything with them. They, they ridiculed them. They, and uh, they, they put them into bondage. And here God says, okay, you've treated my people that way. Let me show you what I can do. God brings judgment. He judges the hard-hearted. Today, if you've hardened your heart to the Lord, be careful. Be careful. Don't think you can continue in the hardness of your heart without judgment coming from God. If you're unsaved today and you're continuing to refuse Jesus Christ as your personal savior and you're hardening your heart because you don't want to do anything with him, you're happy with your life the way it is, you just be careful because the mercy of God might cease and the judgment of God might fall on you. And if it doesn't fall on you here on this earth, let me tell you, there is an eternal judgment waiting for you. And Christian, today, you have the name of Jesus. You say you're a Christian. Uh, you say that you profess that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Don't harden your heart to the voice of the Spirit of God. Uh, don't grieve the Spirit. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't just uh, uh, close your eyes and your ears to what God is trying to do in your life and what He wants to do in your life. Because if you continue in that direction, the Bible says that God will chasten whomsoever He loveth. Do you want the chastisement of God upon you? It's time that we wake up. It's time that we respond to what the Lord has for us. Uh, God would want to judge the hard-hearted. He wants to develop. He wants to develop you and me and give us favor in the eyes of others. Have a look in chapter 11. And we get now towards the end. The Lord said this to him, speak now, verse 2, and speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow from his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver, jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Well, that's a very different position, isn't it? 
Very different from when Moses came and entered into Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh said, who, I- who are you and who is your God and why should I listen to you? Now God has elevated Moses that, that the people feed him, feed who Moses was. And now Moses, when he stands up and speaks to his own people, and they've seen the wonders of what God was doing in him and by his command, that they, that God elevated him in their eyes, that they began to respect and understand this was the man of God. God elevated Moses and Aaron, and and God could be doing this very work in you. As you sit under the mighty hand of God and being patient, God is doing a work around you, in you, to elevate you, to give you favor. And with that favor, God will use it to fulfill the vision that he has given you. What should we do with the vision that God gives us? What should we be doing with the vision that God gives us? God has given us a vision here at Faith Baptist Church, and uh, we have it up there on the screen. We want to be people who are nurturing. We're we a church that is nurturing people to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, if that's what God would have us to do. And this was not some fancy words that we just came up with and thought this would make a great slogan. Now, this was something that God impressed on my heart and showed me and said, listen, why don't we as a church become such a dynamic place where people come in, they see our love and our reach for them because we want them to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I wonder whether you can capture that vision yourself. I wonder if you could just grab a hold of that vision and say, God, I I want to be that person that will fulfill that vision in my life, that I would reach people, that I would be a blessing to someone. I want to be a blessing to my family. I want to be a blessing uh, to my unsaved family, to those who I work with. Uh, God, I want to be that person that will help others be nurtured into a relationship with you. And that is, uh, I have a vision for people who are lost, and God, would you engage me in showing them Jesus Christ? And Lord, I I don't want it to stop there. I don't want to be just that. Uh, Lord, I I want to be an encouragement. I want to encourage my brothers and sisters. Uh, I want to get alongside one who maybe has fallen, one who's a little bit weak, uh, someone who's doubting, someone who's a little bit frustrated. God, I want to go put my arms around them, and I want to help nurture them that they would have a greater relationship with you. You see, that's what Christianity is all about. That is hand in hand, uh, side by side, shoulder by shoulder, family by family, working together. What do we want to do? We don't want to be fractured. We don't want to be uh, isolated. We don't don't want factionalism in our church. We don't want different parties and different groups. Uh, We want to be united together in one vision under God that we would serve him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, loving him dearly, nurturing, trying to bring people to know him as their personal savior. There's a vision. There's a vision. There's a vision for us to grab hold on to and to follow. I wonder whether you will take time even this week to pray over these words. Pray over this vision that God has given us for our people and for those who come in contact with us. The Lord, would you use us? Would you shape us? Would you help us? That we would be one who cares and nurtures other people that they will have a relationship with you as salvation, but also to continue their walk with you. Would that be something you would desire? Would that be something that you would say, I want to grab a hold of that vision? Or or does that come into conflict with some of your self-interests? Or is that in conflict because of the hardness of your heart? Do you think, no, that will never work? No, no, I I, I would disagree, it never works. I wonder what would be the obstacle in your life today that hinders that vision. I pray for us as a church that the Lord will multiply us, that the Lord will use us as an impact. And really our impact is not because of a kind of service that we have here in in church on a Sunday, but really it's about what kind of people we are in our community. You understand what I'm saying? The impact of this vision is not about how we are together here. 
but about how we interact and relate to other people in our communities when we're out during the week. Hold on to that vision. Hold on to the vision that God gives you, even though it may not materialize right now. God is doing a work in your life. He will bring it to pass. And, and uh, sit down and resolve your self-interest conflict. If, they, if you have some self-interest that are conflicting with, with the vision that God has given you, let me tell you, you are far better off to fulfill God's vision than to fulfill your own plan. Can I repeat that again? You're far better off for all of eternity to fulfill God's vision in your life and his purpose than it is for you to do what you have planned. Some of us have had the calling of God. Some of us know exactly what God wants from us. But you know what we're doing? We're struggling with it. Because it's in conflict with what God, what, what, what God wants and what I want. We're in conflict. I pray today that you would submit. You would submit yourself wholly to the Lord and say, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, as you have planned for me, what the vision is for me, Lord, I submit myself to you and I would ask you that you fulfill it in my life. Wait on the Lord, his timing. I don't know how long it's going to take for you. It took me 30 years. But God was faithful through it all. God showed me many things. God developed great things in my life to make me the man that was needed for the hour. God is probably doing a work in you right now. God is preparing you. Hold on to the vision that God has given you and he will bring it to pass. When the vision is impaired, when it feels like it's doubt, and I don't know how this is going to come to pass, I don't know if God will really fulfill this. Uh, he gave me a vision, he gave me a thought, he gave me a dream, but I don't know if this is ever going to come to pass because of all the obstacles that have come my way, and life has thrown a different thing at me all the time. I'm not sure how it's going to be fulfilled. Listen, just hold on. Ask God to renew that vision for you to renew that hope, to renew that purpose. And then grow through that and have yourself ready for when God will begin to do that work in your life. Our God is a faithful God. Our God is a merciful God. Today, if you don't know him as your saviour, the first thing you need to do is cast yourself upon his mercy. You need to call out to the Lord and say, Lord, life is not working out the way I planned it to be. But you have a purpose for that. Maybe, Lord, you're frustrating, frustrating my life and my pathway that I come to know you. Well, run to him today. Accept him as your savior. Allow him to forgive your sin and to give you the hope of eternity. Why continue to be confused? Why continue to bash your head? Why continue to be frustrated? Come to Jesus and he will save you. May our eyes be upon him. Look into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And may the Lord use us to his glory as we live our time out here on earth, accomplishing his will, his task, and fulfilling his vision for our life personally and for the life of our church. Let's pray. Is there anyone here this morning that would say, Pastor, would you help me today? I would need to know how I could be saved. I need to know how my sins can be forgiven, how I can know for sure I'm going to heaven. Is there anybody here this morning that would say, Pastor, would you help me? I'm not going to embarrass you. Just slip your hand up. I just want to take time after the service. Sit down, open up the scriptures, show you how you can be saved. Is there anybody here this morning who would say, Pastor, would you help me? Just slip your hand up. Nobody looking around. Christians, pray. Pray for those who have listened to this message. Pray people who need to respond. Maybe you need to respond to God's message today. What have you done with the vision that God has given you? Has it been impaired? Allow the Lord to renew it for you. What would you do? Anybody here that say, Pastor, would you pray for me? God has spoken to my heart. Just slip your hand. I want to pray for you today. Any Christians who say, God has spoken to me. Amen. 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 Now, Father, you know our hearts. You know... Uh, where we're at Lord uh, we just uh, cast ourselves upon you I pray that you help those who need to be saved that they will call upon Jesus today and Lord for Christians that you will continue to work in their life renew our vision Lord sometimes we get busy with life and 
and we get frustrated with things that are taking place and, and we lose all hope as to fulfilling your purpose and your will in ours. But Lord, would you renew that vision? Renew a vision to someone here today. Renew our vision as a church. Lord, that our eyes would be upon reaching others with the gospel. Pray, Lord, that you would do this work in us that only you could do. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.